Hi, I'm Steve Selig, founder of Fit Test, and in this series of on the laws of the heart as applicable for exercise professionals. The third video in this series is on preload and its effect on stroke volume, and this is known as the Frank Starling Law. So just before we get on to the Frank Starling Law itself, I'm just a this is a nice graphic of preload and afterload and their effects on uh, cardiac contractility and therefore heart performance. So preload, which is the topic of this video, uh, examples would be uh, the volume of blood in the ventricles at the end of diastole increasing in hypervolemia, which is a medical term for increased in fluid load across the whole body, but also in particular to the circulating blood volume. So for example, if someone has heart failure and, there were, and then they were ill-advised by some well-meaning person to drink three litres of fluid per day when they really should only be drinking one and a half litres of fluid per day, they could end up hypervolemic. And I'll show you very nicely on the next slide what the risk of this would be to that person's health. Um, and in fact, if it was extreme enough, it would put them into hospital with acute pulmonary edema, or if you like, water on the lungs in a failing heart. So this is not to be um, played with. So hypervolemia, this is a balance between fluid intake and fluid um, output through the urine and sweat and so on. Um, and um, many, very many of these um, clients with heart failure will need to be on a diuretic and on a medically controlled uh, fluid intake regime. Now, a, a different topic altogether is regurgitation of cardiac valves. So if we, for example, if we took, um, well, the valves are not actually shown here, but if we take the left ventricle here and the aorta, which is not shown here, now if the aortic valve, which is just sitting around here, was to be leaky, then blood would leak back into the ventricle during um, diastole when the heart was relaxing. And that would cause an extra stretch on the heart during diastole when the heart was relaxing and that heart would then be challenged to try and uh, increase its output on the next pump and that doesn't very work very well for people with heart failure and that's an example of preloading that heart with too much fluid simply because the cardiac valve is uh, a leaky valve and normally these will have to be surgically corrected or using some catheter technique of um, correcting those cardiac defects. And heart failure I've already mentioned, so the failing heart, the heart is not able to contract properly, so it can't get rid of blood sufficiently during the pumping phase or systole, which means there's too much blood left in the chamber at the end of the pumping phase, and then that gradually overstretches and overfills, and the heart does not respond well with that at all. And I'll show you much more about that on the next uh, slide. So in terms of afterload, uh, this is really talking about how much resistance the left ventricle must overcome to circulate blood, in other words, to produce stroke volume and cardiac output. Now, for example, if someone has peripheral vasoconstriction, which really is pretty equivalent to hypertension, high blood pressure, this is where the peripheral arteri arteries and arterioles are constricting down and offering more resistance uh, to blood flow through those um, blood vessels. Now the left ventricle tries to overcome that uh, to produce the cardiac output needed for life and for uh, lifestyle. Uh, and um, in so doing, uh, blood pressure goes up a great deal in the left in the pumping chambers, both sides, but I'm really focusing on the left side. An increase in afterload is really equivalent of an increase in cardiac workload. Now we come to the Frank Starling law itself, which is the topic uh, here. Now, I just want to show you the, um, the orange curve first, which is the normal resting curve. Now, before we do that, uh, the Frank Starling law is defined as the ventricular performance, in other words, stroke volume, the amount of blood pumped out of, of the ventricle, the pumping chamber for each beat of the heart. So if you think of stroke volume as ventricular performance, that's a good way to go. Now that has a relationship with the amount of filling of that ventricle. So generally speaking, now what that's called is ventricular end diastolic volume. In other words, it's the amount 
of blood, which is in the ventricle, the pumping chamber, at the end of the relaxation phase, the filling phase, just before it pumps. And then what it pumps out is called the ventricular performance or stroke volume. So the x-axis is really talking about preload. So um, for the normal healthy person at rest, as, um, as so if we just, um, I'm just pointing to where that person might be at rest. When they go to walk, we get an increase in cardiac output, which produces an increase in uh, filling volume of the left ventricle or increase in venous return first, increased filling volume of the left ventricle. When they go to run, this is accentuated further and they go up their own curve. So a normal healthy person will go up from their own curve. So that will be their stroke performance at rest here. And then when they're walking and then when they're running, the stroke performance obviously goes up and it goes up in conjunction with the amount of filling. Now, why does the filling go up as heart rate goes up? Well, that's because cardiac output has gone up and that creates uh, an increase in venous return, which in turn results in an increase in left ventricular end diastolic volume or preload. So that's what happens in the normal situation. When we add in, say, the effect of adrenaline, or when the person exercises, then we move up a curve. So we not only move up uh, along our own curve, we actually move up a curve. So if you've got adrenaline on board, instead of being here um, for walking, you'll generate the same stroke performance with less filling volume and so on. And so we can go up a long, long way through this curve. So that's really going from a normal healthy person under resting conditions to an exercising person with the um, overlay of say adrenaline. Now in heart failure, what happens is the opposite of that happens. So for a given in, in heart failure, to get a given stroke volume at rest, say if I'm following along this bottom um, dashed line corresponding to rest, the heart has to have more, will, will fill with more blood. So if I go back to this previous slide, there'll be more preload, more preload in heart failure um, when the person is in what's called compensated or stable heart failure. For a given stroke volume, they will have increased filling. And over a period of time, they will gradually go up this curve or this curve, if you like, will shift gradually to the right. So if, as they go up the curve, they're still compensated, they still produce stroke uh, volume, but there is a tipping point. And the tipping point is shown in decompensated heart failure here, where the curve, uh, uh, we're moving further and further to the right along the curve, and eventually the curve doesn't produce enough stroke volume to really sustain life. And that's called fatal myocardium depression, or if you like, unstable heart failure, and decompensated or decompensated heart failure. Now, I haven't talked about pulmonary edema here. Now, pulmonary edema is the accumulation of fluid inside the lungs themselves, if you like the lay term for that water on the lungs. And this increases the distance between the pulmonary blood vessels, the blood vessels arriving or existing in the lungs themselves, and the alveoli where the gases are for gas exchange. So um, then we get poor gas exchange and we get uh, people severely out of breath and severely anxious and in fact uh, can even die. So pulmonary edema we don't want. So we want to keep people away from pulmonary edema. And pulmonary edema occurs when we reach a certain critical, end, uh, critical point for end diastolic volume. Then we get fluid accumulating in the lungs because of the failing heart. So we... The, the cardiologist will always try to get someone or to prevent someone from getting into decompensated heart failure where there's a large amount of filling of the heart. There can be water on the lungs or acute pulmonary edema and there can also be very poor stroke performance. So the cardiologist will try to avoid that and keep people over here in compensated heart failure and that will be with usually with medications, lifestyle and other interventions. So just the, to summarise, the compensated or stable heart failure is really a shift to the right in uh, compared to normal, where at rest and walking, for example, they need more filling of the, of the ventricle in order to produce the same stroke performance. Um, and obviously, we're going up here as we, as we move into exercise. 
Uh, we now come to first line medications in heart failure. The, the first is the effect of diuretics. Now diuretics will take someone from the top of their curve back to the left. So um, for amount of for amount of um, uh, filling of the heart, for the amount of filling of the heart by by drying someone out with diuretic, will take them to the left on their curve. It won't sacrifice stroke volume very much, uh, but what it will do is prevent someone from going into acute pulmonary edema or even um, decompensated heart failure. The effect of inotropes is um, uh, used really just for palliation or symptom relief because it's um, it's a self-defeating um, uh, therapy that can't be given long-term because it will accelerate the progression of heart failure. But for palliation purposes only, it can be given to just boost someone up into a higher curve if they are in decompensated heart failure. An example of inotropes is digoxin. The effect of ACE inhibitors is similar um, to diuretics but works through a different mechanism. And basically ACE inhibitors or angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors uh, such as uh, perindopril um, will uh, take people to the left on, their, on Starling and keep people safe and keep people away from pulmonary edema and also from such a high left ventricular and diastolic volume as to really make their life um, a misery and possibly even risk um, uh, death from heart failure. So um, three, quite a similar to um, uh, diuretics, but a different mechanism. And beta blockers are not part of the Starling scenario at all, but beta blockers work differently. Uh, they work by decreasing systolic blood pressure, decreasing heart rate, and in so doing, they decrease rate pressure product and decrease the work of the heart. So they help out heart failure by decreasing the work of the heart. So just in summary, the diuretics... Um, shift people to the left on Starling, which keeps them safe in terms of pulmonary edema and still protects their stroke volume and prevents um, excessive preload. ACE inhibitors also do that. Uh, inotropes such as digoxin are given just in palliation, uh, not long-term therapy, just to lift someone up a curve to give them some symptomatic relief. Now we come to threats and opportunities for people exercising in heart failure. Now, the first thing we want to do, as you can tell from this scenario, is we want to keep a control over preload and not have too much preload in individuals with or at risk of decompensated heart failure. Now, to do that, we should avoid high-intensity training and high-intensity interval training. I'm sorry for those of you who are convinced that high-intensity training and high-intensity high interval training uh, you know, uh, should be applied to everybody. They shouldn't. Uh, they should not be applied in, for someone at risk of decompensated heart failure because they will push someone to the right and, in fact, over the tipping point for both pulmonary edema and also very poor stroke performance. The blood pressures will drop afterwards when you stop the hit. Blood pressures will drop through the floor. The person will be highly symptomatic. And worse still, they're probably going to have some pulmonary edema. Encourage upright exercise compared to supine exercise such as swimming uh, because upright exercise just protects against having too much venous return, whereas horizontal exercise or supine exercise or prone exercise such as swimming will promote venous return. Now, that's not to say that people in heart failure can't swim. If they're not getting symptoms, certainly, um, and they're accustomed to swimming, there's no reason why they couldn't swim. But again, I wouldn't go for high intensity swimming for those clients. Discourage deep water exercise because that shunts blood into the chest and, and, and in so doing promotes venous return, increases preload, which may push them over the tipping point and push them down this slippery slope here shown in green, which may make their heart failure worse, put them in hospital with acute pulmonary edema and preload will be excessive. Uh, we want to also... Um, uh, what, what happens often in heart failure is the proof of resistance will be decreased. Um, we want to avoid exercise in cold weather because what that will do is will shunt blood back into the chest, which will increase the, uh, the um, afterload in, uh, and, in fact, increase uh, preload as well. Um, because on the preload side of it, when you get shunting of blood into the chest, 
that increases venous return or preload, but also um, when we um, exercise in cold weather, we have vasoconstriction occurring peripherally to prevent this the blood getting to the skin in cold water or cold weather. And um, so we want to avoid exercising that. We really want to be exercising people in heart failure in thermoneutral conditions. In other words, not too hot and not too cold. And we need to manage, especially prevent post-exercise hypotension. Uh, a very poor ventricular performance will produce hypotension and uh, they'll be highly symptomatic with that. So the way I manage or prevent post-exercise hypotension and I would say that mostly I prevent and I very rarely have to manage, is a couple of things you can do. Step the exercise down from your final workload. Step it down slowly so you're maintaining some blood pressure uh, through that recovery period. If you do get hypertension, you need to lie someone down. But someone with severe heart failure, decompensated heart failure, I would not elevate the legs because by elevating the legs, you'll flood the uh, heart with venous return, flood with venous return, increase preload pre very quickly and, and cause problems here uh, with going down the slippery slope of this green graph and getting into pulmonary edema and other problems. So certainly you have to lie someone down if they're going to faint, but I would not elevate the legs. So thanks for uh, listening to this video on preload and the Frank Starling Law of the Heart. Hope you have a great day. You can contact me at info at myfittest.com.au. Bye for now.